All right, there's my Facebook audience, and I think my Periscope audience is there too, waiting on my phone to flip. All right. <clears throat> uh, we're going to start out with a word of prayer, but I have to tell you, if I could tell you the last 24 hours of my life, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it, but, you know, when you're getting close to manifesting some real blessings, when you're really walking in what it is God wants you to walk in, I'm still waiting on the screen to flip. You can count on the enemy coming at you in so many different ways. So many different ways, you wouldn't believe it. So, now it looks like my periscope has frozen. Okay, might have to do a reboot on that. Always something. Okay, so I'll just reboot that, but we're going to move forward with my uh, Facebook audience. All right, so uh, I want to start out with a word of prayer. Prophet David Taylor here. So, let's start with prayer. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for an opportunity to minister your word. Thank you for uh, another chance, O oh Lord, to come into your presence, to hear your voice, to move by the power of your spirit, to tap into the truth of the word of God, O oh Lord. So I just ask you to speak through my mouth. I surrender my mind and my mouth to you, O oh God, that you might speak through me, that you might use me to glorify yourself, O oh God, that you might be glorified and that the saints might be edified and that the demons might be terrified. We thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Pull my prayers go back up. Okay, so, yeah, like I said, if I, if I could tell you the last 24 hours of my life, you would not believe it. So before I go into the lesson, and also I'm waiting on my prayers to come up, I just want to say to you that are those of you that are going through a rough time I want you to be encouraged because rough times are a sign that you know your deliverance is nigh that you're going to win that you're going to get your breakthrough you're going to get your blessing you're going to graduate you're going to a new level that new things are going to be breaking out in your life and the enemy is going to try as hard as he can to try to distract you to try to discourage you try to make you despondent see because if you get a heavy heart then it's hard to move forward when your heart is heavy. So that's why the devil's always trying to get you with depressing thoughts or, or give you them heart blows that just make you so discouraged and so heavy you just don't want to go on anymore. But for those of you that are going through uh, those very things, again, I just want to encourage you and let you know that those types of things are signs Signs that you are winning, signs that you are going to break through, signs that your deliverance is nigh, signs that that the things that God said are, are coming to pass. And they already come to pass when God says them, but when we say come to pass, we mean manifest. And by manifest, we mean they show up out here. And I keep trying to tell people that, that you don't have the full victory until what you are waiting for manifests out here. Okay? It's got to manifest out here, <laughs> okay? It's got to manifest out here. you got to be able to see it, hold it in your hand. Because eventually, I'm just uh, loading my periscope again, eventually you got to remember Isaac showed up. Remember that Isaac showed up. Remember that Abraham and Sarah were both very old. Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90, and God promised them a baby. But remember, the baby did eventually come. And so that's what I tell people all the time, that your Isaac has to show up, man, that you, you have to get that manifestation. You have to have it out here and hold it in your hand. That's the victory you're waiting on, okay? That's the victory you're believing in. It already was done when God said it, because whenever God says something, it happens as soon as he says it. But what we need is the manifestation thereof. So in other words, I need it in my life, okay? Because it's not going to do any good back there in the invisible realm. There we go. Hello, Periscope. It's not going to do any good back there in the invisible realm. When God spoke it, it instantly manifested. But I need it out here in the physical realm in my life where I can walk in and live in and enjoy it, that kind of thing. Okay? All right. So we already had a word of prayer. So uh, as usual, let me tell you that <clears throat> I'm going to give you a lot of information. and It's going to come at you fast. So you're going to need to watch this video more than once. 
What's my tagline? My tagline is that God already told you what was going to happen if you would just listen to his servants, the prophets. I can't stress that enough. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. God gave us five. A lot of people only honor evangelist, pastor, and teacher. That's three, and they ignore apostle and prophet. But part of the prophetic anointing, part of the prophetic call, is to let people know what's going on before it happens. Okay? So if you have the prophetic in your life, God already told you what was going to happen. He already told you what was going to happen if you would just listen to the prophets. Okay? All right. So uh, welcome again to all my audiences, Facebook, Periscope, and YouTube, and wherever else you might be listening. Those of you that are joining me live, thank you for joining me live. Thank you for being patient. <clears throat> Always uh, something going on with technology or the internet or something. Uh, please like and share. Wars, amen. Please like and share. Whenever God releases a prophetic gift, a prophetic word is designed to change things. And normally it's designed to change nations. How do I know that's true? Because when you look at all the prophecy in the Bible, the prophecy in the Bible is designed to change nations. Okay? Sometimes it's local, sometimes it's cities. But many times it's entire nations are changed by the prophetic word of God. So please like and share this video in many places as you can. And invite people to watch. If you're watching live, invite others to watch. If you want to sow into my ministry, um, Matthew 10, 41, whoever receives a prophet, because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. I've got a PayPal.me link on Facebook and on my Periscope profile and on my Twitter feed. And... Um, you can donate to my uh, not-for-profit on Amazon Smile, okay? I always hashtag everything I do with hashtag PDT. That's where to find me on YouTube or Periscope or Facebook or wherever you're looking on the Internet. So you know it's me. You don't have a hashtag PDT on it. I'm live every week like I am now, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And this Thursday, the second Thursday of every month, I have a teaching that I do called No More Genies, where we're breaking the genie concept of God and getting ourselves back to true faith based on what the word says and not all these other crazy ideas sometimes we get. Uh, appropriately, this is Valentine's Day week, and so I'll be talking, I'll be doing part two of my series on marriage. Um, so I did last month, I did part one of my series on marriage, and now I'm doing part two. Uh, so just a warning, is going to be rough. Last month was really, really rough because I'm cutting through a whole bunch of stuff. So it's going to be rough this Thursday, just fair warning. <laughs> All right, so let's dive into today's lesson. Today's lesson is a very familiar passage of Scripture, but as always with the prophetic word, we want to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. What is He saying to us now, and how does it apply to our lives? Okay, so we're going to read the story about Jesus uh, raising Lazarus from the dead. That is in the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, fourth book in the New Testament. Remember that the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation were all written by the same man. That's Apostle John, not John the Baptist. But the Apostle John, the one that laid his head on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper, the one that Jesus gave Mary to, he said, you know, behold thy mother, behold thy son. His best friend in this life was Apostle John. That's who wrote the Gospel of John. Okay? So this is the Gospel of John, chapter 11. You really need to read the whole chapter, but I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to start at uh, verse 38, okay? Because the prophetic word for today is loosed. Prophetic word for today is loosed, okay? So here we go, John chapter 11, verse 38. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus come forth, and he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Oh my goodness. So many sermons preached on this particular miracle. 
But what I want to talk about today is loose and what does the Holy Ghost want us to get out of that for today? The answer to that question is, is that God wants to loose you from the things that are killing you, loose you from the things that are holding you in a grave, in a tomb, in a dead place. God wants to loose you from anything that's stopping you from living your life. But we have to examine the text carefully to see what some of those things might be, okay? Then Jesus, verse 38, and Jesus again groaning in himself came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. So the first thing you need to understand is that you might be boxed up in something and it might not even be of your own making. How can we say that? Because obviously Lazarus didn't roll that stone in front of the tomb. He was dead. You might be in a situation where you feel like you're boxed in and it's not even your fault. Okay? So like the Lord said, he's, Jesus said, take away the stone. So the first thing the Lord wants to do is if there, if there are any stones in your life that are sealing you up in some cave somewhere, the Lord wants to take away those stones. Okay? Now I discovered that when God is doing new and exciting things in your life, it doesn't just take faith. It takes courage. What do I mean by that? Why does it take courage? It takes courage because you're going to look crazy. It takes courage because you're going to have to go against the grain. You're going to have to do things that don't make sense to the people watching. It doesn't make sense to anybody that just had a funeral for somebody to come along and say, take the stone away from the grave. There are some areas in your life, there's some deadness, there's some things that have been you have been uh, sealed up in or are sealed up inside of you. And people don't know they're there. You might not know they're there or you know they're there, but you may have forgotten because they've been dead so long. So when the Lord comes into your life, the first thing he's going to do to get you loosed, he's going to say, take away those stones. That's going to look crazy. What do I mean by that? God might say the same thing to you that he said to Abraham, get away from your family, get away from your kinfolk. That's the first thing that the Lord said to Abram. He was still called Abram back then. That's the first thing the Lord said to Abram when he called him was get up out of your homeland, away from your family and go to a place I'm going to show you. At 75, what if you're at an age and stage in life where people have basically counted you out? People have said that you're over. People have said you're too old to do whatever. And God says, time to move, time to get your hat and go to a new place. What if the Lord said that to you? You see what I mean? That's going to look crazy to some people. Now, you got to be sure that that's what the Lord is saying to you. Don't just jump up and do it. But if the Lord is saying that to you, it's going to look crazy. What if you write your magnum opus at the age of 65? What if you've been writing your whole life and the work that you get remembered for, you don't write until you're 65 years of age? All up until that point, everybody's going to be telling you, you too old to succeed. <laughs> You missed your window, blah, 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 blah. But what if it comes for you at 65? Remember, 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 remember what happens when you listen to people. People don't know the whole story. Some people peak at 25 and then don't know what to do with the rest of their lives. Did you know that? <laughs> but anyway, so when the Lord comes in your life, anything that's got you trapped up in that tomb, he's going to say, take away them stones. And it's going to take courage for you to do that. Let me give you another practical example. What if you've wanted a relationship for a long time, and let's say your heart has been smashed into so many pieces, you can't count the number of pieces your heart is in. If you had to take a snapshot of your heart, it's in so many little pieces, you can't even, you know, count them. And the Lord says he's going to bring someone in your life. Do you know what you have to do? You have to have the courage to open up that heart and love again. And that's not the easiest thing in the world to do when you've been hurt. Because love involves a level of trust. And many times the hurt that we experience in life is because trust has been broken. Okay? But if God tells you, I'm going to bring someone in your life. I'm going to bring that special someone, that bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh relationship what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to take the chance to open up that heart again. Because if you don't open up your heart and love them, why would they stay in your life? Why, why would they? That's going to take a lot of courage, especially if you've been hurt a lot. Okay. So number one, the Lord is going to come in your life and start removing stones. 
that's not only going to take faith on your part, it's going to take courage. Okay, on to the next. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to Jesus, now stop here. For those of you that don't know the background, <clears throat> Mary, Martha, Lazarus were friends of Jesus. And whenever Jesus was in town, he would stay at their house, sleep at their house, eat, you know, some food. So Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and Jesus were friends. So Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, if you didn't know, was not some random family. When you read higher up in the chapter, they come to the Lord and say, He whom thou lovest is sick. What that means is Lazarus, one of your, your closest friends, is sick and sick unto death. So they're not just anybody, okay, just, just so you understand. And that's going to be relevant with what I'm about to say. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, Lazarus' sister, said to him, Jesus, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Now, right there. So the second thing the Lord is going to call on you to do is he's going to call on you to change your perspective. Martha spoke in the natural. Jesus spoke in the supernatural. So number one, the Lord is going to ask you to roll away those stones, or he's going to begin to roll away the stones from you. But number two, he's going to change your perspective. Why? Because again, Martha came from the natural. What she said was totally natural. Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he has been dead four days. The same thing is true in our lives. If you haven't <clears throat> excuse me, done something in a long time, you might be kind of rusty. <laughs> or you might have the stench of bitterness. A lot of people got the stench of bitterness. You know why? You know how I know that? Excuse me. You know how I know that? I know that because of the way we love when we're young. How do we love when we're young? Well, when you're young, you love, first of all, with an open heart because you don't really know any other way to love. And when you're young, you love unreservedly. When you fall in love when you're young, when you're young you give that relationship all that you have. Because when you're young, you don't know how to love any other way. But if you're not still with your first love, y'all didn't make it, or they left, or you left, or they died, and you have got to love again, or maybe you've had a lot of relationships since then, there's going to be a stench. <laughs> and many times that stench is a stench of bitterness. Because when you walk around talking about, you know, people are no good, and ain't no more, no, ain't no more good men out there, and... And, you know, these folks ain't loyal and all that different kind of stuff. That's hurt talking because that is not what you said when you first loved. When you first loved, you just jumped right in and gave it all that you had. That's the beauty of loving when you're young. But after a while, after a while, that heart takes too many blows, you might get bitter. Okay, and so, so there's going to be a stench and it's going to come out of you. So just to let those of you know. If you are going to get into a relationship with someone that's been hurt, maybe even hurt a lot, you can't take that stench of bitterness personally because it's going to come out of them. You can't be in a grave for four days and not stink, and you can't have had a broken heart that you've been kind of hiding or maybe nursing or whatever, and then when it opens back up, it's like opening a crypt. There's going to be some smells come out of there that aren't so pleasant. So I'm trying to encourage those of you that are maybe getting with someone who's had a lot of hurt in their life, you're going to have to hang in there and let them work through that stench because you can count on it being there. You can't love that way but one time. That's why they call it first love. When your heart is all the way open and that love is freely given, that only happens one time in your life. You're never going to love that way again. So if you're, if you're rising to the challenge of loving at whatever age and stage of experience of life you're at, going to be some smells come out of there that ain't so pleasant, okay? So you're going to have to hang in there with that person, or if you're that person, you're going to have to hang in there with yourself, okay? Because like Martha's saying, going to be some stench if you've been in a grave. That's natural. But then here comes the Lord with a perspective switch. He says, Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Now, that's just like the Lord, okay? Because faith calls those things which be not as though they were. That's just like the Lord to say that the natural circumstance is not a limitation for me. 
So Martha speaks in the natural, okay? And then Jesus answers that in the supernatural. And he says, did I tell you, if you believe, you see the glory of God. The Lord is saying right there in clear terms that that's not a limitation for me. If your heart has been locked up for a long time, if your body's been locked in a grave, if your dreams have been buried for so long that when you start to unearth them, they stink. The Lord said, that is not a limitation for me. If you believe, you're going to see the glory of God. If you believe. Not if you're young enough, not if it's the right stage of life, not if you're the right color, not if you're the right gender, not if you have enough money. The Lord didn't say any of that. All the things that we say are natural. That's not what the Lord said. The Lord said, if you will believe, you would see the glory of God. And that's exactly how it happens to this day, because his word doesn't change. If you want to go back to school, if you want to get a new home, if you want to get a new relationship, if you want to have a child, maybe late in life, if you want to birth a business, if there's something inside of you that you always wanted to do since you were little, like uh, I know this person who told me something I didn't know about them, because I think they were in the 60s when they told me, they told me that they always wanted to be an artist, like a painter. I didn't know that. And then I saw all this painting they've been doing since they were like 19 years old. I was like, wow, I just didn't know. I just didn't know that about them. And they told me that was actually their dream. But I think they were in their 60s when they told me that. If that's where you are, the Lord said, if you believe, you're going to see the glory of God. Not if you did it at the right time in your life. <laughs> Not all the other things that we speak that are natural. Okay? Because the Lord just said, if you believe, he just superseded all that. Okay, so that's why I, I tell, I'm telling you that if you're going to go through this process, it's not just going to take faith. It's going to take courage. So number one, you have to roll away the stones. Number two, you're going to have to switch your perspective from the natural to the supernatural. Okay, let's move on. Then they took away, <clears throat> then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted, lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Stop. Why would the Lord say that? Let's read it again. He said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. That's past tense. So whenever Jesus prayed about raising Lazarus, he already did it. And the Father already heard him and said yes. And I know that you always hear me. That's ongoing. You always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. So, number one, roll away the stone. Number two, switch perspective. What is number three? Number three is you're going to have to have some whole new confidence. You're going to have to have a boldness and a confidence that you have never had before. Because a lot of people don't pray to God like that. A lot of people don't pray and say, Father, I thank you that you heard me. And I know you always hear me. A lot of people don't pray like that. A lot of people say, oh, Lord, if it be thy holy will. And that's not what the Bible says. And the Lord never said that. If you study the prayers of Jesus, he never said, if it be thy will. He never said, if it be thy will. Okay, that's what we say. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he prayed to Father, he never said, if it be thy will. Okay, go back and study the prayers of the Lord. You see what I mean. See, so the confidence you have in God is going to have to change. You're going to have to pray and believe a whole different way. Um, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Now, how do we get God to hear us? Okay, I want to look that scripture up so I can tell it to you. That scripture is in 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, verses... Uh, 11, 12, and 13, but the one I want is 14. First John chapter 5, verse 14, written by the same apostle, Apostle John. First John chapter 5, verse 14 says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Verse 15, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. That's how you get God to hear you. You pray in his will. How do you know the will of God? Well, first of all, you have to ask him. Second of all, you have to spend a lot of time in the scriptures. 
Because all the promises that God wants you to have and know and be are in the scriptures. And when you learn how to pray in the scriptures, and when you learn how to discern, uh, seek God's face and find out what he wants for you, then you can pray with that kind of confidence that Jesus prayed. I thank you that you've heard me. If the Lord already told you you can go back to school, then you need to start praying, Lord, I thank you that you heard me. And I know you always hear me because I'm praying according to your will. A lot of people don't pray that way. If God told you he's going to send you a spouse, then you say, I thank you, Lord, that you've heard me. And I know you're going to send me the bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh person that you custom designed for me to marry. See that? You're going to have to change your level of confidence. And that level of confidence is going to have to be reflected in your prayers. Because a lot of people don't pray that. But they say, if. And the Lord doesn't say, if. Okay? So... Number one, roll away the stone. Number two, change your perspective from natural to supernatural. Number three, your confidence is going to have to go to a whole new level. Okay? Next, verse 43. We're back in John chapter 11, verse 43. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Stop. After the Lord prayed, the Bible says he's, when he said these things, he cried with a loud voice. Well, how does that translate into us? You're going to have to cry out about your dream. You're going to have to cry out about what you want to happen. Because I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that people that live their dream are never silent about it. People that live their dream are always talking about it. Think about it. Think about anybody that's successful and anybody that's where you want to be in life. They're always talking about it. They're always talking about it with a loud voice. They won't shut up about it. If they want to go to the Olympics, if they want to, want to run for office, if they want to write a book, if they want to buy or build a building, it doesn't matter. They never stop talking about what they want to accomplish. They are constantly crying out with a loud voice. He cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. So take out the name Lazarus and substitute your dream. And say, I cry with a loud voice, book career come forth, or book come forth. I, I cry with a loud voice, wife come forth, or husband come forth. I cry with a loud voice, Olympic gold medal come forth. I cry with a loud voice, uh, mayoral campaign come forth. A gubernatorial campaign come forth. Presidential campaign come forth. Think about it. Think about it. You're going to have to cry out. You're going to have to talk about it. And you're going to have to talk about it loudly. That's why the step before was confidence. Because you got to know. Because the devil's going to come at you too hard. <laughs> you got to know something. <laughs> you got to know. You can't be thinking. You can't be talking about if. But you got to cry out with a loud voice. You got to say it. You got to say it loud. Okay? And you have to name it. Because everybody says if the Lord had just said come forth and all the dead people would have got up, which is true. But the Lord said Lazarus come forth. He named it. That's why you got to say marriage come forth. You got to say financial breakthrough, come forth. You got to say, you know, number one selling book, come forth. You got to say new house, come forth. You got to say post secondary education, master's degree, come forth. You got to do what the Lord said do if you want to get what the Lord got. Okay? Then he says, verse 44, moving on, and he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Good God Almighty. I want you to notice what that verse tells us. That verse tells us that that thing you are calling, that you want to come forth, might have some stuff on it that you have to clean off. Now, I can't tell you how many times in life people have missed their blessing because they thought it was going to come wrapped in cellophane like meat at a deli. They thought it was going to come prepackaged, shrink-wrapped, uh, you know, with that cellophane stretched over it, with the styrofoam thing, because when you buy meat, you can get the fat trimmed off, and obviously the meat has the blood drained out of it, drained out of it, or you can get, buy meat with fat. You can get custom cuts of meat now, which kind of spoils us here in America. But I want you to notice that when you get your custom cut of meat, you are used to that meat being drained of blood, trimmed of fat, if that's what you want, and then you have that particular uh, slice that you want available to you, okay? 
Well, what the Bible says is that, and he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Do you understand what that means? That means that when your blessing comes forth, might be some stuff on it. Now, my father used to work at a slaughterhouse. And my father had his big barrel chest because my father was a big man. And you never, you know, if you like eating meat, you don't want to watch it get made. You don't want to see what actually happens in a slaughterhouse if you've never seen what that is. If you Google it and you look at what they actually do to take them animals from where they are to being them cuts of meat on your plate, you, you're probably going to get nauseous if you have a weak stomach. But the truth of the matter is, is that the blessings that we want when they come forth, they're going to come forth with some stuff on them. And that's how so many people end up missing the blessing because they thought it was going to come cellophane wrapped. They thought it was going to be like a cut of deli meat. Let me give you another prime real life example. And here it go. I know here it is the proper English, but here it go. Having a baby. If you've ever seen childbirth, real live childbirth, where the, the mama is pushing the child out of the womb, it's rough. When you first come out of your mom, your head has that cone shape because you just came through the birth canal and your skull isn't fully formed. It's not hard yet. All your bones actually are quite soft. So you, you kind of look like the canal you just came through and your head kind of has that slope back here. Look at a newborn to see what I'm talking about. And what you're covered, I mean, you're purple and you're covered with placenta and blood. Sometimes they have to turn the baby's head as it's exiting the womb to reposition the child to be sure the shoulders can be positioned right so when the mom is pushing, she can push the baby all the way out. And the umbilical cord is still attached to your belly button. And then the doctor has to hit you. The reason that the doctor slaps the baby, if you didn't know, is to make you use your lungs outside of your mom for the first time because you've never breathed outside of your mom before. So when you're a newborn, you don't know how to breathe out here. That's why the doctor hits you and you feel that pain and ah, you start crying because you have to breathe in to cry, to use your lungs. You have to cut the umbilical cord and then they have to take a funnel and they have to suck the mucus out your nose and sometimes got to clean your eyes and sometimes out your ears. So normally they do all that right away and then the placenta comes out of the mom. Once they do all that, then they take the newborn and put it on the mother's chest. So they actually have to clean you up a little bit before you even get to lay on your mother's breast. And then when you take those pictures, sometimes they clean you up even more. So childbirth, to get a baby out here, is labor intensive for the mother. But then when the baby comes out, there's all this cleaning that has to be done. That's the same idea here. That's the same idea in life. I can't tell you how many people have missed their blessings in life because they weren't willing to do a little cleaning work. <laughs> because the blessing came, but it didn't come just like fully packaged, fully formed in cellophane, neatly cut with all the fat trimmed off and with all the blood drained out and with the specific cut of meat that you wanted. That is not That meat didn't get there that way. Somebody slaughtered that animal <laughs> to, to give you that deli cut, okay? And I stopped by to tell you, let me give you an example of what that looks like in real life. What that looks like in real life, for example, is reconciling a relationship. If you get back together with someone in your life, and I don't just mean romantic, I mean anybody, a family member, a longtime friend, maybe, you know, a work situation, maybe a church situation. If you get back together with someone that you haven't had in your life in a while because y'all fell out a long time ago, you will have to clean that relationship off to get it back to where it needs to be. It's not going to come prepackaged. It's not going to come wrapped in cellophane. It's not going to come drained of blood. The same thing is true about your spouse. The same thing is true about a marriage. I can't tell oh, I can't tell you the number of people that truly believe that when you meet the one, that you're not going to have to work through anything, that you're not going to have to deal with whatever comes along with having them in your life, because you will. You're going to have to clean some stuff off, man. It's not going to be this neat thing. And that's why a whole lot of people have turned their nose up at their blessing. God turned himself into a man and walked this earth for 33, maybe 33 and a half years. And many of the people that were alive, that looked at him, that saw him with their own eyes, 
did not believe him or take advantage of the fact that for the first and only time in all of creation, God was on earth as a man, having sent himself through the womb of a woman the same way we're born. God had never done that before, and he's never going to do that again. Yet, some of the people that looked right at Jesus, they looked right at him, didn't believe and didn't take full advantage of what that must have been like. Do you know why? Because he didn't come in the package they thought he would. Because he didn't look like what they thought he would. Because he didn't act like what they thought he would. And they were like, if it ain't going to go the way I imagined it in my head, then forget it. Can you imagine if you looked into the eyes of Jesus, you were looking into the eyes that made the world. Can you imagine? We hear the Lord's voice now, but we hear it in the spirit. What if you could hear it audibly like you're hearing my voice? What if you were hearing the Lord's voice through your ear canal? through the, the, the wave vibration, the audio waves in the air, as opposed to in the spirit, the way we hear it now. Can you imagine? That's a once in all creation experience. And some people were right there in Jerusalem when the Lord was alive and completely missed him. Completely missed God in the flesh. That ain't going to happen but one time. Do you know why? Because he didn't look like what they thought he was going to look like. He didn't act like what they thought he was going to act like. And he wasn't saying the things they thought he was going to say, so they missed it. How is that relevant? Because when your miracle comes out again, he who had died, Lazarus, came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Because they put a, a cloth on your face to, it's like to mask you in death. What are you going to do if you meet someone and there's some stuff you have to work through? Okay, what are you going to do if you get a new job and it's not perfect? You got to work through some stuff. That's how so many people think, well, this can't be from God or this ain't the bus or whatever because it got to work through some stuff because it's not prepackaged and perfect. And, you know, it's not all clean. It's not everything that, you know, you thought it was going to be in your head. So you say, forget it. I can't tell you how many people have missed their blessing. How many people have missed their blessing? How many blessings have you missed in your life? Because God sent them to you. Let me give you another example. <clears throat> if God sent somebody to minister to you, might not be who you had in mind. If God puts a prophetic word in the mouth of someone and they come to give it to you, you might be one of those people, because I know people like this, you might be one of those people that feel like, if I can't get ministry from the pastor, then forget it. <laughs> I want the big cheeseburger. <laughs> I don't want you little junior cheeseburgers. <laughs> you don't count. I don't, you know, you ain't the pastor. You're not whoever. So you can't minister to me. I don't, I don't want that. Lord have mercy. If I could tell you, if I could tell you the number of people that feel that way. What if you go to a very large church and somebody in your family passes? And what if there's a bunch of funerals that week? Pastor can't be in more than one place at one time. So what if pastor sends an associate pastor or an associate minister? A whole lot of people get an attitude because they don't want the associate minister. They want the pastor. And a lot of people miss their blessing and the same with the prophetic word. I found out in my life, both on the receiving end and I found out both on the ministry end that you don't get to tell God how he sends his word to you. One more time. You don't get to tell God how he sends his word to you. You don't get to tell God how he sends his word to you. You either receive it or you don't. Well, I don't like that minister. You don't have to like him. Did you know there's no commandment in the Bible that says, Thou shalt like thy neighbor as thyself? Did you know that? God had never told you that you have to like. God told you to love your neighbor as yourself. He never said you had to like. Okay, there is nothing in nature that holds his head down because people don't like it except people. Orange trees don't apologize for making them oranges because some people like bananas. Apple trees don't apologize for them sweet apples because some people like grapes. Don't nothing live and do that except people. Okay, nothing live and does that except people. And you walk around with your head down, feeling bad about yourself because someone's because they don't like me. So what? 
Everybody's not going to like you. Everybody's not supposed to like you. That's not even relevant in life. Did you know that? Did you know that's not even relevant in life, whether or not people like you? Jonah, for those of you that don't know the story of Jonah, you probably understand Jonah in the belly of the whale. The reason Jonah ran from God is because God told Jonah to go preach to the Ninevites, and Jonah hated the Ninevites. Jonah says later on in the book, he did not want God to have mercy. That's why Jonah said, I don't want to prophesy to him. I don't want to preach, because I knew if I did, you'd have mercy and you'd save him. And I don't want them people to be saved. I wanted them people to die and go to hell. Jonah said that. And God said to Jonah, is that the right attitude to have? Are you doing well to be angry? Why should not I give the Ninevites a chance? Because there's a lot of people there and also a lot of cattle. God said, there's a lot of people and a lot of resources in Nineveh, and I have no desire to destroy them if there's a chance they might repent and come to faith in me. And he sent a prophet there that hated them. <laughs> he sent the Ninevites a prophet that hated them and wanted them to die. That's in the Bible. Read the book of Jonah. Jonah hated the Ninevites. He wanted them to die. And that's who God sent to prophesy to him. Now, I just want you to imagine that scenario. That's why Jonah ran away. Jonah was like, I ain't doing that. That's why Jonah got in the boat, and then there was trouble on the sea, and then the other people in the boat figured out something in his boat ain't right. And then they figured out it was Jonah. Then they threw him out. And then the whale came and got him and swallowed him. Okay? And then after three days in the belly of the whale, Jonah said, fine, fine, fine. I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay, and then he went, went and preached to the Ninevites, and sure enough, they repented, and they got saved, and Jim, Jonah went somewhere and got an attitude, because he was mad that them people got saved, because he wanted God to destroy them. I just want you to think about the dynamics of that situation. God might send you a prophet that don't even like you. <laughs> he might send you a prophet that don't even like you, because like is not relevant that's stuff that people say. That's not in the Bible. 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 When God chose King David, he didn't say, do y'all like him? <laughs> that ain't what he said. Okay? It's not relevant. I know you don't like that, but that means we have to grow up and come out of ourselves and stop thinking that you get to tell God how a blessing has to come. God might send you a prophetic word through somebody that don't like you or somebody that you don't like. What you going to do? You have to get past your feelings and learn how to receive what they have to say. Uh, I've noticed for big name preachers, I've noticed that there's a lot of people that's always full of criticism. And I'm saying to myself, you don't have to like them. If they are sent from God, they serve a function. Because being an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher is an office. And if God puts the mantle of that office on you, there's something he's put inside of you that the body of Christ is supposed to have. And it's your job to do your job and release to the body of Christ what you're supposed to give it. That don't have nothing to do with whether or not you like it and whether or not other people like it. Do your knees take a vote as to whether or not they want to be your knees? Do your lungs take a vote with your brain and say, well, I don't think we want to be the lungs today. Is that how your lungs work? You got four fingers and a thumb if you got a whole hand. Does the thumb take a vote and say, well, I want to be the short one on the end, the opposable thumb. Did, did they take a vote or did you just come out with hands? Because like is not relevant. Okay? So that's what I mean when I say, going back to our lesson today about being loosed. God might have somebody that's wealthy write you a check, and you don't even like them. They might come from an ethnic group that you don't like. They might come from a part of the world that you don't like. They might speak a language that you don't know. And you're so busy up there in your feelings, tripping on the way God sends you stuff. You don't get to tell God how he's going to minister to you. And if you are a minister, you don't get to decide. <laughs> you don't get to decide where you get sent. Mm -hmm. I've met black people that were the only black people in a church full of Caucasians. I've met Caucasians, white people, that was either the only white person or one of a few in a church full of black people. That can be rough sometimes. 
But if God calls you there, then there is where you have to stay. Sometimes, further down the road of life, God is planning on sending some new people into that church. <clears throat> and God wants them to see a face that looks like them. Maybe that's why he called you there. Maybe you're the only black person in a church full of a bunch of different ethnic groups, and you are the only African-American there. And you say, why in the world am I here? Maybe two years from now, God's going to send a whole new wave of black people, and when they see you, they say, oh, we can join this church. Maybe that's your assignment. Did you know that? Well, what if I'm the only woman in the mix? What if I'm the only man in the mix? What if I'm the only person my age in the mix? Everybody else is 18, 19, 20, here I am, 35. Or everybody else, 40, here I am, 65. They gonna laugh at me, yes they will. They gonna call me old, yes they will. They gonna make fun of me, yes they will. So what? If they got it at 40 and you get it at 65, you need to learn how to say, thank God I got it. Thank God I didn't leave this planet without getting my blessing. OK, so that's why I want you to understand that, again, the scripture says he was bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was wrapped in a cloth. And the Lord said, loose him and let him go. So our prophetic word for today is loosed. So that's why you have to understand that if you're going to get loosed, uh, let's review. We're going to go over those principles. If you're going to get loosed, it's going to be like what the words say. It's not going to be like the way you thought about it in your head. It's going to be like what the words say. I can't stress that enough. It's not going to be like what you imagined in your head. Because what you imagined in your head was that some angels are going to come floating down with your blessing on a golden platter. And they're going to say, here, David, here's what you've been waiting for. Oh, that's what you, it ain't going to happen like that. It's going to happen like what the words say. So let's review. What's our first principle? Our first principle is, is verse 38. Take away the stone. You're going to have to roll away some stones in your life. You're going to have to let the Lord roll away from stones. If you want to get married again, you're going to have to open that heart back up. And I know you don't want to. I told you, it does not just take faith. It takes courage. So number one, roll away the stone. Number two, you're going to have to change your perspective. Martha spoke in the natural. She said it had been dead four days. There was a stench. Jesus spoke in the supernatural. Did I say if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? That's number two. Number three, your confidence is going to have to go to a whole new level because you have to pray like Jesus prayed. Father, I thank you that you've heard me. And the way we get God to hear us is to pray according to his will. Because the Lord never said, oh, Lord, if it be thy holy will. Haven't you heard people pray like that? And they pray with a lot of fervor and a lot of passion. But the Lord never said, the Lord never said, if. Not one time does the Lord say, if it be thy will. Okay. And then, uh, next principle, the Lord cried with a loud voice. You're going to have to talk about it. You're going to have to say it. You're going to have to speak it. If you want to run for mayor, you're going to have to talk about running for mayor. If you want to get married, you're going to have to talk about getting married. If you want to get a new home, you have to talk about getting a new home. Okay? And then next, finally, uh, when the Lord cried with a loud voice, Lazarus came forth. Then when your blessing comes, it's going to come with some stuff on it, and you're going to have to loose it. You're going to have to... You know, unbound those 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 uh, binding things, uh, ropes, whatever was on him, and unbind that face and clean it up a little bit. The same way that meat is cleaned up before you get it in the deli, and the same way you got to clean that baby up. You can push that baby out your womb, but you got to clean that baby up for that baby to live out here. And before you take that first picture, oh, you know, look at my little baby, put that first picture on Facebook, going to have to be some cleaning, going to have to have some mucus coming out that nose, some mucus coming out the ears, okay? Okay, so those are the principles we talked about today to get you loosed. So like I told you before, you're going to have to watch this video more than one time because I said a lot. But those are the principles to apply to get your miracle to manifest, to get your breakthrough to manifest. Because where we need it is out here in our lives where we can see it and walk in it. Okay, if it's shut up into some grave somewhere, that's not doing us any good. Got to come out here. Okay, all right. If you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen now, and I will uh, pray for them. Anything you want prayer for, put it on the screen now. 
Now, I say it every week. When you see me close my eyes and I'm praying in tongues, I'm asking the Holy Ghost, is there anybody that needs physical healing? And are there any unclean spirits that need to be cast out? That's what I'm doing when I do that. So if you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen now. Otherwise, I'm going to move to the next part and I'm going to see. <clears throat> because I'm a firm believer in physical healing. We are supposed to walk in the legacy that Jesus left us of physical healing. And nobody came to Jesus and left just as broken as they were when they came. When you come to Jesus or even remember that the shadow of Peter healed people. Healed people. So when you come to Jesus or you come to people that know the Lord, or you come to people, pray for my hair restoration. All right, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray for Erica's hair restoration, that her hair come back, oh God. I speak to that scalp. I speak life to that scalp, oh God, and I ask you to give light all around her scalp and her hairs, oh God, and I ask you to spring back to life. Okay, Erica, take your hand and put it on your head. Say, in the name of Jesus, I speak life to my hair, and I speak life to my scalp, and I command all dead things to go. I curse you from the root, and I command you to dry up. And from this day forward, let healthy hair spring forth in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay? Amen. So that's why uh, I always have a section in my ministry for physical healing. Because you're not supposed to come to the Lord and leave just as broken as you were when you came. But that never happened in the Bible. Not one time did anybody come to Jesus for healing. And then walk away sick or broken or just as mess, messed up. Amen. You're welcome. Just as messed up as they were when they came. Okay? So, that's what I'm doing when I close my eyes and I pray in tongues. So, I already had one blessing right there. Okay, the Holy Ghost is saying somebody got a problem with their nose. Take your right hand and put it on your nose and say, in the name of Jesus, I ask for, I command... My nose will be every whit whole. All the muscle, all the bone, all the meat, the way my nose is structured, I command it to be every whit whole and to come back to health right now in Jesus' name. Okay? Our son dudes have intention. We're asking for wisdom to raise him up. All right. In the name of Jesus, I pray for our uh, son do so, God, that you would uh, put an obedient spirit on, uh, in him, oh God, that you would put a good teachable spirit that he might receive what his parents have to say that he might be a good child, oh God, and be in the obedience position, that he might listen to you and listen to daddy and mama, and that they might have the wisdom to, to prepare him for his purpose, because you, you sent him to them for a purpose. So reveal to them, oh God, the purpose you gave them that child, that they might raise him up in the way that he should go, and they can get him on the path of life right now, today. And we believe you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, man. Surge up my nose. Amen, amen, right, yeah, because there's only one Holy Ghost, that's right, and I also want those of you to know, those of you ministers to know, that whenever you speak the word by the leading of the Holy Ghost, amen, thank you, whenever you speak the word by the leading of the Holy Ghost, you'll feel it as you say it, whatever you release, man, it has to come through you, and when you speak life and healing, man, every time I go into physical healing, I feel that anointing flow through me, I kid you not, like I told you a couple weeks before, remember that mole that was underneath my eye, it's gone, because I cursed it, and I commanded to dry up from the root. And I had that mole underneath my eye for a long time, and look, it's gone. Ain't nothing there but the, that little dot. See what I mean? Hey, amen. So about the God bless you. So that's what I mean when I say, you know, I always tell you I'm living what I'm teaching. But if you're a minister, open yourself up to let the Holy Ghost, let healing power flow through you. Because Peter was so anointed that even his shadow healed people. That's the level we're supposed to walk in, saints, to where even when people get around your shadow, the anointing healing power of God is supposed to be so strong that bones start popping into place, okay? That's our legacy from Jesus, that we don't have to live this life sick, crippled, or broken. And I'm going to preach that till I leave here. I don't care what nobody says because I know what the words say. So I don't care what they say, okay? All right, let me see if there's any more. Okay, the Holy Ghost is saying mouth and throat. That also could be potential cancer. Who needs prayer? Uh, she's in the system and is staying in the shelter. Okay, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for this ninth grader, that Erica's element, Lord, that is in the shelter of God. I should give her a home 
Give her parents and give her a covering, oh God. Plant her in good ground and good soil so she can grow and become the person she's supposed to be. You brought her in Erica's life for this reason, that she might pray over her and bring you into her life, oh God. So we line up with your purpose, and we know you've always heard us when we pray according to your will. And you say that you want orphans, oh God. To God sets the solitary in families. So give this little girl a family to be planted in so she can grow up straight and strong and live your purpose and give testimony to how the blessing of God is upon her. In Jesus' name we declare it. Amen. Amen and amen. Uh, uh, mouth and throat. That may be potential cancer. So if you're a smoker, for sure that's for you. Okay? Because the Holy Ghost showed me mouth and throat. So right now do this. Put your hand on your lips. Put your hand on your throat. Say, in the name of Jesus, I command my mouth and my throat to be every whit whole. I curse cancer. I curse mouth cancer. I curse lip cancer. I curse tongue cancer. I curse throat cancer. I cast it out of my body, and I command it to dry up from the root. And I speak life to the cells of my lips, life to my mouth, life to my tongue, and life to my throat. And I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we declare it. Amen. Amen and amen. So whoever's out there that's for, do it just like I showed you. Okay? If you're watching this on the replay, do it just like I showed you. Put your hand on your mouth and your hand on your throat and speak those words that I spoke. You will feel the healing power of God begin to flow through you. Okay? And like I told you before, that healing miracle, you got to say it. You got to keep saying it. Don't let the devil bring it back. Okay? Because as Christians, we're not supposed to be checking out of here early from no sickness, disease, or anything like that. We're supposed to live long and fulfill our days. But we have to stand on it in faith, just like everything else. Okay? All right. Now, let me see if there's anything unclean needs to be cast out. I'm going to ask the Holy Ghost. Hold on. Oh, Lord. Okay, 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 oh, oh Lord, uh, okay. Huh. All right, somebody, you know, sometimes when the Lord, oftentimes when the Lord is using you, he lets you feel what he's talking about. There's somebody listening to me right now, you got something way down deep in your belly, it looked like bitterness, because I saw it in the spirit, it looked like bitterness. I stopped by to tell you that if you walk in the spirit of bitterness, you open your life up to demons and let them take root way down in here. And there's somebody, some here, somebody watching me, you got something sitting way down in your gut that to me, in the spirit, looked like bitterness, like something had a hold on you that you've been carrying for a long time. In the name of Jesus, I speak to that spirit of bitterness way down in your gut. I call you out by name, spirit of bitterness, and I cast you out in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Come out, and you can't come back. Come all the way out, because I see it. I see, it, see people puking it up. Come all the way out. I command that spirit of bitterness. Come all the way out in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Yes, you're going to throw up. Yes, it's going to be puke and bile. Whoever I'm talking to, that's, that's normal. That's what demons do when they come out. You have to spit up. You got to hurl. In the name of Jesus, I command that bitterness to come all the way out. Yes, you've been afraid to love. You've been walking in a twin spirit of rejection. In the name of Jesus, rejection. I command you to come out. I call you out by name. Spirit of rejection, I command you to come out in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth because the demons are subject to us in the name of Jesus. So bitterness and his twin sister rejection, I command you to come out. Come all the way out. No residue, no staying in the lungs, no, no hiding in the abdomen, no hiding up here. I command you to come all the way out. Come all the way out. Come all the way out in Jesus' name. And whatever person I'm speaking to, you're going to laugh again. You're going to love again. You're going to live again. Wherever that bitterness comes from, it's out of you now. And now you need to get filled with the Holy Ghost and filled with the Word of God. And God's going to show you how to live again, how to laugh again, and how to love again in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Okay, there's a prophetic word I need to release and then we'll be done. For behold, my people, I have called you to be loosed. I died a brutal death. I took the stripes. I was arrested. I was spit upon. I was beaten. I was humiliated. They put a crown of thorns on my head. 
They nailed me to a cross. They stuck a spear in my side. And for six hours I hung on Calvary's cross that you might be loosed. I have already paid the price for all of your sins, past, present, and future. Stop walking in guilt, for there is no more condemnation to those who are in me, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Stop walking in guilt, stop walking in con condemnation, and realize I already took your condemnation on my cross at Calvary. So from this day forward, my people, walk in freedom. Be loosed. Don't allow anything to put you in a spirit of bondage. Don't allow anything to make you go back in that cave. Don't allow anything to make you get bound up again with grave clothes and dead things. But walk in the freedom and the liberty that I shed my life's blood to give you. Right now today, says Jesus Christ through the spirit of the living God. Amen and amen. Whew. That blessed my soul. I say it every week, but when the spirit of God is speaking, that blessed my very soul because the Lord is right. We don't need to be walking in condemnation. What did he go through all that brutality for if we're going to still walk in guilt? He paid. Jesus paid it all. Praise his holy name. That's why we love the name of Jesus, because it, rec uh, it represents our redemption. When the devil comes to accuse you, you don't stand against the devil in your name. You stand against the devil in Jesus' name, okay? You don't stand on how good you are. You stand on how good he is. You don't have to shed your blood, because Jesus shed his blood, and that's what we stand on, that's what we stand in, and that's what we stand behind when life comes at us, all right? So that blessed my very soul. So amen. God bless you. Those of you that tuned in live, thank you so much for tuning in live. God bless you. You know, I appreciate the support. And I'm always living what I'm teaching. So those of you that are ministers, I encourage you to do what the Lord is telling you to do. You have a function. You have a place in the body of Christ. And it's very important that you offer to the body what God is calling you to offer. Everybody's not going to be you know, a big name preacher, everybody's not going to have a stage, everybody's not going to be that person, but everybody's important because that's the way God's kingdom works. It works the same way your body works. If things go well in your life, you'll never actually see your lungs or your kidneys or your liver or your stomach, but they got to do their job every day, don't they? It's like that. So don't worry about being seen. Worry about doing your job and letting the Lord use you Make your contribution while you live. If you are called by God to do something, go ahead on and do it. If you are not called to pastor a church, if you're not called to be on TV, then get on Periscope, get on Facebook Live, get on the street corner if you have to. But make your contribution. Put out there what the Holy Ghost is leading you to put out there because we need it. The body of Christ needs it. So I just want to give you that encouragement. All right? Amen, amen. So I'll be here this Thursday at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time for part two on marriage, which is appropriate because it's Valentine's Day. And uh, we're going to be talking about many of the things that the Bible teaches us to avoid. Uh, one of the things that the Lord showed me in my study on marriage is that there's a lot of scriptures where the Lord has actually given us warnings about situations not to get in, but we get in, get in them anyway. And then once we're married, we want it to be fixed. But we don't understand that that situation started before we ever walked down the aisle. So what I'm going to be talking about this Thursday, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time, is we're going to be going through some scriptures, and we're going to let the Lord show us through the Word how He's telling us to avoid, avoid certain situations, avoid, don't let yourself get in here so that we can get our marriage off on the right foot. Okay? All right, so that's what's going to happen this Thursday. So tell your friends, tell everybody, tell everybody to tune in, check it out. This video is going to go up on YouTube in about an hour. Thanks so much. So I'll be here this Thursday, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, and same time next Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. All right? God bless you. I love you with the love of Christ. Have a great week, and remember that you are loosed in Jesus' name.